and Taylor Wiles proof of uh, the Shimura Teniyama conjecture. And, um, but one thing that's sort of uh, new in kind of what might be now called Piatic Langlands, which was sort of absent in a more traditional theory of Piatic automorphic forms, is really the use of representation theory of Piatic groups as a kind of substantial tool. And so that's what I want to, uh, part of what I want to try and convey in the talk today. But I think, uh, I mean, I was kind of told that this talk should be something of a colloquium style, and certainly I know there are uh, students here who aren't experts in, in number theory. So let me begin with some sort of background. So let me begin by talking about a sort of big motivating question, which you might call the fontaine mazer langlands conjecture. So that, that title deserves its own board. And then we can put the conjecture on the next board. So it's something like this. Cuspidal automorphic representations of GLN AF should be in some sort of correspondence with representations from GF to GLN of QP bar. Maybe irreducible, continuous, irreducible. There's a, there's a lot that's very uh, sloppy in this formulation and I'm gonna try and tighten some parts of it, not all of it but I need to explain what some things are. So here F is a number field. And uh, so GLN AF is GLN of the Adels of that number field. And the, uh, we can talk about the cusp forms. So we can look at say uh, cusp forms, which are functions, complex valued functions on GLN of AF mod GLN of F. So as uh, Jacob explained in his talk two days ago, here we have a locally compact group and here we have a discrete subgroup, so we have this quotient. We can look at the cusp forms. So if you're not an expert, roughly functions here which uh, decay nicely near the cusps. And these cusp forms have an action of GLN AF and because, of the, because these are cusp forms, there's a, a Hilbert space in a product, an L2 in a product. And so this is some direct sum of, of irreps. And these irreps are the cuspidal automorphic representations. And over here we have GF. So this is, by GF I mean the Galois group of the algebraic closure of F over F. And this is a profinite group. And so you can look at its representation. So we, let's take a nice, a, well, roughly locally compact field, QP bar, and we can look at the irreducible representations. And now the conjecture is that these should be actually 
somewhat closely related to each other, although prima facie, they look absolutely unrelated. About the only thing they have in common is n, which is appearing in two quite different ways, n-dimensional representations, whereas here it's a matrix, the group being represented as n by n matrices, and they have f in common. And that's about all. So let me uh, sort of recall a little bit about how this correspondence is supposed to go. There's no P on the left. There's no P on the left. So I'll, I'll, you have to come to that, of course. So, so one thing is that, well, GLN of the Adels is kind of roughly a product. So what I'm going to say now, I could have a number field F, but it's easier just for me psychologically to, to have Q because then the primes can can be called by numbers and letters rather than symbols. So let me just take F to be Q, and then we have just GLNR, and then GLN of the two attic numbers, and then GLN of the three attic numbers, and so on. And, and now we have our pi, and our pi is an irreducible representation of this product group. So our pi will ten factor as a tensor product of irreducible representations. And so we'll have a pi infinity, and a pi two, and a pi three, and so on. So a representation of GLNR, of GLNQ2, and so on. So the first thing to think about is sort of what these individually could be. And well, in the case of uh, GLN, actually the irreducible representations of all of these groups are classified. And so we know what all the possible choices are for each of these pi infinities, pi 2, pi 3, and so on. And then you can just tensor those together to make irreducible representations pi. So what's special about the cuspidal automorphic representations is that, see, if we just had f functions on GLN and EF, that would be the regular representation. That would see any pi we wrote down. So what's magical about this space is there's some global glue, which means that the kind of uh, pi's, the different pi p's that appear here are not random. They're somehow connected to each other in some way. And trying to understand that way is trying to understand how the, you know, which pi p's can be glued together to make a, a, cus form, a cuspidal representation is uh, one of the mysteries of the subject. So, so what happens on, on this side? So if we have our representation row from the Gala group of F into GLNQP bar, well, we can similarly restrict it to the Gala group of the real, the real numbers, and then to the Gala group of Q2, the Gala group of Q3, so on. So, so just as our cusp, Cuspidal representation gives us local data at every place. Our Galois representation gives us something local at every place. And again, the local Galois groups are not hard to sort of describe in some sense, roughly speaking. And you can attempt to write these down. Now, there's going to be one basic difficulty. When I say that a local Galois group is not hard to describe, a local Galois group has basically three pieces. It has a Frobenius aspect because its residue field is FP, and FP bar over FP is non-trivial. There's a Frobenius automorphism. And then there's uh, inertia coming from ramification. And the inertia has two aspects. There's tame inertia, which is what you would see if you were looking at Lorentz series in characteristic zero, kind of unwinding a circle. And then there's wild inertia, which is a pro-P group. And see, so if we take, if we have our prime different from P, this group is almost pro-P. This kind of compact part is pro-P, basically. And so if we're looking at Q2, and P is odd, the, inertia, the, the wild inertia in Q2 is a, pro, is a two group, and this is basically a prime to two group if P is odd. So the, the wild inertia can't interact very much with this group. So away from the prime P, the wild inertia can't, inter, can't sort of get too, in a, too a kind of interact too much with this group, and so it's, you can classify what the... Uh, representations are essentially. At the prime P, the wild inertia is a pro P group, and this is a piatic group, and then there can be lots of interesting representations. And so when I say that it's not so hard to compute these, that's true everywhere except at the prime P. And I'm, have to, 
and the prime p is going to be the piatic in piatic language. So we'll have to come back to that. But, but one thing you, we can uh, sort of, well, one basic principle is that this matching is supposed to take place by matching these individual local pieces of data. And I said here that a typical pi, I mean, a random pi you wrote down just by choosing these independently of each other has no chance to be cuspidal. So similarly, on the one hand, if we look at all these local, so here I, I should have had kind of Galois groups here, G of Q2, G of Q3, G of Q5. If I look at all these local Galois groups inside the global Galois group, they generate it topologically by the Chabotard density theorem. But there's no sense in which this is a free product of those local Galois groups. So if I write down random local Galois representations, they won't give me, they won't piece together to give a global Galois representation because this is not a, it's generated by these but not freely. So that's the same kind of global glue that, that comes from having a, a cuspidal representation appear in the functions on this space, at least conjecturally. So, but so the idea is one is supposed to match these uh, local pieces of data and then hopefully match the global pieces of data. Already you see something sort of strange because this row of GR, I mean, of all these Galois groups, the one that's easiest to write down is the Galois group of the real numbers, which just has two elements. And so there's not a huge amount of information in this uh, row of GR, although there's some important information. This pi infinity has, has certainly more information than just a representation of that uh, group of order two. So this pi infinity, so by kind of Harris Chandra and Langlands, roughly gives you some Hodge numbers. And, and this pi infinity is essentially roughly classified by kind of giving uh, kind of a set of n Hodge numbers. Yeah, let me <laughs> say. So exactly, so if we were doing G or two, then we could describe things in terms of classical modular forms, and this pi infinity would either correspond to a classical modular form, holomorphic modular form of some weight k, and then these Hodge numbers will be k minus one zero, and zero k minus one. And or it could correspond to a mass form, and a mass form would have, a, would have an eigenvalue of uh, one quarter plus t squared, and then these Hodge numbers will be i t, i t, zero, zero. And so if you look, well, so this is why Hodge numbers is in quote. So this i t, i t, well, if we believe Selbo's conjecture, then this, uh, this t is, is real, and these are purely imaginary numbers, and so this is not, what you would normally think of as being a Hodge number of something algebraic geometry, unless t is equal to zero. So among all the objects here, the ones that you might expect to kind of have a, be of a more motivic nature, so where you might have a chance to flip from a complex world to a piatic world, are the ones where the Hodge numbers are integers. So, so over here, to, if you want to turn this dotted line into something a little more solid, the first thing you might do is here restrict attention to the objects whose uh, Hodge numbers are integers. So those are called algebraic. Algebraic cuspidal automorphic forms. So technically it's a condition on the infinitesimal character. And now, what about on this side? Well, here you're just getting some plus and minus ones coming from a matrix of order two, so you can't read off any Hodge numbers from there. But actually somewhere in this list, we have the local Galois representation at P, and these have Hodge numbers. Actually, technically they're Hodge sen Tate numbers. And these Hodge sen Tate numbers are piatic numbers. But and if you have a, a, a Galois representation whose Hodge numbers have some random piatic numbers, well then you can't maybe probably expect that to be connected to anything on, on the other side. So the kind of bridge between 
the, or the, the, the kind of bridge that might possibly link the two worlds is a bridge where you have just integral Hodge numbers on each side. So, well, if you have a GABA representation whose locally P whose Hodge numbers are integral, that's called Hodge Tate. Actually, that's still, morally, that's the correct condition. It's maybe still a little bit too weak. And so the technically correct condition is uh, one where you not only ask the Hodge numbers to be integral, but you ask for slightly more. That's called being Durham. And so here, we should put Durham at P. And then there's a, now a precise conjecture that the uh, irreducible, continuous irreducible representations that are Durham at P and are unramified at almost all primes should match with the algebraic cuspidal automorphic representations, which are algebraic. And, but, and to match them, to, to, to make this completely solid, we still have to say how we could ever match complex information with piatic information. So we should choose an isomorphism between C and QP bar. And then, uh, and then we can hope to match things in the following way. So, so then how do we match things? So the matching is that sort of the, the Hodge numbers of pi infinity should equal the Hodge numbers of the pi of the uh, Galois representation locally of P. And then the, the, the pi restricted to G of QL, where here L is unramified. So L shouldn't be in the level. L should not be in the level of the uh, cusp form generating this cusp representation. This should match with the Galois representation locally at L. And how does this matching occur? Well, when at an unramified prime, our cusp form generating our cuspidal representation just gives you a Hecker polynomial. So you have a Hecker polynomial. And the Hecker polynomial should equal so this will also be unramified, and so you have a characteristic polynomial of Frobenius. So that's how you, how you match things. And, and here's where you use the isomorphism between C and QP bar, because this Hecker polynomial is built up of Hecker eigenvalues, so it has complex coefficients. And this characteristic polynomial of Frobenius is a characteristic polynomial of a piatic matrix, so it has piatic coefficients. But we can talk about these being equal, once we've fixed that isomorphism. And, but part of what one will believe and try to prove is that in fact, these uh, Hecker polynomials should have algebraic coefficients. And this characteristic polynomial Frobenius should have algebraic coefficients. So that you're not really matching C and QP bar, you're really matching the algebraic closure of Q inside here with the algebraic closure of Q inside here, which is a much more uh, kind of morally reasonable thing to try and do. So, so this is, this is how you match. And actually the, uh, the arrow from left to right is almost a, uh, a theorem now. So, so this direction kind of is, is almost known, meaning that it's known if, if, we, if we, for example, say regular algebraic, then it's known by the work of many, many people, too many for me to really write down. So let me kind of say that Deline and Carriol uh, and Langlands and Clausel and Kotwitz and Harris and Taylor and Shin and uh, Harris and Taylor and Lan and Thorne. So there's an incredible amount of work building this direction. And, and a lot is known in the other direction as well. For example, for the, there's uh, Langlands and Tunnel and then Wiles and Taylor Wiles, and then many names that come after, the, after those. So, but what I want to talk about is what happens at the ramified primes. So, so what if L is ramified? So that means that L is dividing the level of our cusp form 
or L is a primary ramification of rho. Well, if L is not equal to P, then as I said, the, uh, the Galois representation at the, sort of the Galois representation locally at L is, is not so hard to kind of describe. You have Frobenius eigenvalue, you have a uh, tame inertia, generator of tame inertia has some uh, characteristic polynomial, and then there's some finite amount of wild inertia. And so be because, because this is, uh, because when L is different from P, describing this Galois representation is essentially an algebraic thing that you have to describe, just one matrix for Frobenius, one matrix for tame inertia, and then a, f a finite, a representation of a finite group, a finite quotient of wild inertia. It doesn't really depend on the field. So again, although we're working over QP bar, we can go back to working over C. And then there's the local Langlands correspondence. So that we have the local Langlands correspondence, which relates this row locally at L to our pi sub L, which is our representation of GLN of QR. So, so, this, so this is a correspondence that's constructed in general by Harris and Taylor. And part of the theorems you prove when you, are, when you start with these pi's and produce these rows, you show that the pi l's and the rows match via this local Langlands. The local Langlands is kind of built so that that's, it's like local class field theory. You build everything kind of local and global class field theory sort of together, and you, as you build it, you check everything is kind of compatible. So, uh, so in particular, at an unramified prime, this is just matching a Hecker polynomial with a characteristic polynomial of Frobenius. But at, at our ramified primes, it's a little more subtle, and that's one reason for using the language of representation theory rather than just the language of Hecker eigenforms, the more classical language, because for the, when you talk about Hecker eigenforms, it's hard to really see in, in a naive way what's happening at the ramified primes. So, the, uh, so the, one of the main questions that Piatic Langland is concerned with is what happens at the prime L equals P. So, in that case, we have our pi p, and via local Langlands, our pi p can produce something at the prime p. But what it will produce at the prime p is not the local Galois representation rho. It will just produce some shadow of that Galois representation. Because this local Langlands doesn't see the choice of the prime, right? It, this local Langlands is really happening over c. It doesn't see p. Whereas what I told you was that this rho locally at p can have an infinite image on wild inertia, which depends on L equaling P. So what's happening at locally at this prime P is sort of not something that local Langlands can, can really know about. Thus local Langlands doesn't have a chance to know about it, since it's independent of, local Langlands is kind of independent of P. So, for example, where these Hodge numbers come from, these Hodge numbers come from studying how this row looks, you restrict it, you take your row, you restrict it to GQP, then you restrict it to this pro-P group of wild inertia, then you look at the Lie algebra of that pro-P group essentially, and you study what happens there, and that's how you find these Hodge numbers. So these Hodge numbers are exactly manifesting the possibility of row having a kind of infinite image restricted to wild inertia. So, so the local Langlands will never see those Hodge numbers. And the other thing is that on this side, the Hodge numbers anyway were not obviously not at P because he read off the Hodge numbers from the pi infinity. So on the automorphic side, the Hodge numbers are manifestly at, at the prime infinity. But on the kind of Galois representation side, the Hodge numbers are at the prime P. So, okay. So what, so what sort of happens in Paddock Langlands? Well, I want to kind of explain Next, how to, how to modify this left-hand side to make it fit better with the right-hand side. So, for example, as I just said, on this right-hand side, the Hodge numbers are living at the prime P, whereas on this left-hand side, the Hodge numbers, essentially the weight of the automorphic form, are living at the prime infinity. So I want to modify here this and define 
replace the space of cusp forms by a space of p-adic cusp forms, which will shift the weight to the prime p. So we'll still have a represent an adelic representation, but it'll be a delic representation where the weight information is now at the prime p. And then we'll go back and revisit the local questions. So, so, so let's sort of talk about making automorphic forms p-adic. Well, actually, it's a little bit hard to uh, to do that for GLN because. You know, if you take n equals 2, then what you have here is the total space of a line bundle over the upper half plane. It's a pretty non totally disconnected space. I mean, the upper half plane is about as connected as you can get. And so they aren't sort of interesting piatic valued functions on there that you can naively use to define piatic uh, automorphic forms. So one of the miracles of the Langlands program is that you can change your group. If you don't like your group, you trade it in for a group you like better. And so we're going to take out GLN and trade it in for a group that's compact at infinity. So, well, technically we'll trade it in for a unitary group. But to describe what's happening, it's a bit easier to imagine n equals 2 and to sort of think about trading GL2 in for a quaternion algebra. So let me just sort of say that I'm going to kind of replace GLN by a unitary group. But in the case of GL2, we could also go to a quaternion algebra, say we take a quaternion algebra D over Q, and we look at the invertible elements, so that's a nice algebraic group. And as, you know, when you go to the algebraic closure, it just becomes the group GL2 again. And in fact, we know that at all but finitely many primes, this is split, and so it gives you, locally at all but finitely many primes, it gives you GL2. So if we were to play this whole game with that quaternion algebra, and we looked at what we had here, well, for most prime, all but finitely many primes P, the pi p's are represent pi l's are representations of the same group gl2 ql as we had in the gl2 case, and one of the miracles of uh, Langlands functoriality is that we can actually take an automorphic form under some hypothesis on gl2 and move it to this group. Where moving it to this group means we find a cusp form on this group, but where the pi l's don't change at all the l's where the group doesn't change, and so we do that. And so here it'll be a definite unit group, and here it will be a definite quaternion algebra. And the advantage of that is that now the real points are, are compact, or at least compact modulo the center. So, so what that means is from now on, I'm not going to work with GLN. I'm going to talk about a group that's compact at infinity. <coughs> and then that becomes much easier to think about, because then this quotient is a profinite set. And so then a profinite set, you know, the the piatic valued functions are basically as interesting as the complex valued functions. So, so we do that. So we have G as an algebraic group over Q, reductive or semi-simple if you like, reductive algebraic group over Q, which is compact over R. Just GR is compact. And then we can look at the uh, automorphic forms on G of the Adels mod GQ. Let me put in a level. So KF, this is uh, open in the finite adelic points. So it's choosing some level. And we can look at the automorphic forms on here, which are just, this is now a finite set. And so these are just functions. Yes, it's a, which is fine. I don't want to question that by GR yet. So yes, it's a finite set plus this compact GRs. Thank you. So I just want to look at functions from this to C. So I'll just call that, say, a of KF, the automorphic forms of level KF. And 
this is a representation of uh, so representation of of the uh, real groups. So this A of KF is just a sum. I, so I, I, I don't want to kill off the GR because I want to think of it as a GR representation for a moment. And when I think of it as a GR representation, it's just going to be a sum of some irreps with some multiplicities. So it's going to be a sum over various irreps of that irrep tensored with a multiplicity space, which we might call a kind of KF V, which is a, how do you compute the multiplicities? You just hom V into A. Let me leave off the KF. And so these homs are, are pretty straightforward to describe because we're just looking at functions. So this is just a tensor V dual and this is the GR invariant. But A is just functions on uh, G of the dual is my G of Q. But now, so when we tensor with V dual, they're just functions taking values in V dual. So it's equal to the set of functions, which maybe I'll call F sub kind of R because this is what's happening Archimedeanly. So the functions from G A my G Q to V dual with the property that if I have a function on G and then I multiply it on the left by a, by a function in GR, what I shall get is, uh, I guess, G infinity inverse times F of G, FR. So that's, that's the multiplicity space of, uh, of the representation V. So this is, in, in, you know, in the quaternion algebra case, if we took V to be the sim k minus two representation, then this is going to be just sort of modular forms of weight k. But now we can do a little trick. So it's the same trick you do when you take a uh, algebraic Hecker character and you make it into a family of Aladic Hecker characters. So we can put this in bijection with functions fq. So these are going to be functions from ga mod gr to v dual, which satisfy fq of uh, so gamma is an element in, in, the, in the rational point. So gamma times g is equal to gamma times fq of g. And how do we do this? We just define fq of g is equal to g infinity inverse times f r of g. So this is, I guess, what Dick Gross calls sort of algebraic modular forms. So, so what happened now? What happened now is that our definition to be a modular form, instead of involving something about how some equivariance under the real group, involves equivariance under the rational group. And the rational group is sitting diagonally inside GA, so we can now undo the rational invariance, but at a different place. So we can undo the rational equivariance at the prime p. And so this will be isomorphic to the set of f q p, which are taking g a mod g q. So here, here we should have had k f, because I had k here, we should have k f, and here we should have, what we should, I, oh, we're not going to put in k f. There's, there's something to say here. I'll say it in a minute. So these are going to be functions that satisfy f of g times gp equals gp inverse f of g. And this f of qp is defined by f of qpg is gp times fq of g. Yes, so you're taking functions in v dual. And, yes, and so of course you have to be a bit careful because this was, a, you know, this v dual began life as probably a complex representation of uh, our compact group. But actually all these, these v's can all be descended to some number field. So that guy is over here. Yes, so really, so really what we should do here is we should say that, okay, this is a complex vector space. This is another model for the same complex vector space. But now, because these are in the 
rational group, I can descend V, say, to the rational numbers, and so we get a rational structure on this complex vector space, a kind of canonical rational structure, which we then convert to a piadic structure. So this V-dual is kind of changing avatars. Here it's a kind of complex V-dual, here it's a rational V-dual, here it's a piadic V-dual, but it's really the same V-dual. So, and something happened, see, I, I was kind of, I messed around what was happening here. Well, these are still going to be GR invariant because GR is kind of compact, or let's say it's connected, it can't even do anything at the, when you're looking at these kind of continuous maps of something, from something profinite to something profinite. But at, at, at the prime, the level condition has changed. See, at the prime P, this function is no longer locally constant. See, this FQ, this F, FQ was locally constant at every prime, so at the prime P. But now, our new function is not locally constant anymore at the prime P. Well, that's okay. It's locally constant at all the other primes, but that's not locally constant at P. It's continuous at P. And so, we can now look at the sum of this uh, sort of A, KFV, and now, so this is, uh, well, well now I can just go back and imitate this formula. So I can form this direct sum again, and, and what acts here, well, We have a GFQP representation now. So we get, kind of get GFQP acting. But I have to, uh, so I have to kind of get rid of the level, the smoothness at P because I said that I wasn't smooth at P anymore. So let me put a superscript P to say I got rid of the smoothness condition at P. I kept it at all the other primes. We can form this sum. And this is inside. So wh what is this sitting inside? This is sitting inside, that's a space of all continuous functions from G of A mod G of Q mod GR and mod KF away from P with values in QP bar. What is this quotient? This quotient is a, P, a compact piadic manifold. It sort of has local charts that look like very small compact open subgroups of, uh, of GQP. So this is a nice piadic compact manifold and we can look at the QP bar, bar valued functions and we built a lot of them out of these modular forms. No, no, I, I just mean literally it's uh, profinite, like in the same sense that ZP is a piadic manifold. In the most naive way, like in Sayre's book on, on piadic Lie groups. And it'll be dense. Because any continuous function you can approximate by polynomial functions. So it will be dense. And so it makes sense to kind of think of this as being the piadic automorphic forms. Yes, and then this is kind of the classical modular forms inside, or the classical automorphic forms inside. And the Hodge numbers, which are being remembered by these weights V, are now representations of G of QP instead of representations of uh, the real points. So we've kind of moved the weight from the real place to the place at P. Now, yes. Yeah. Now it's with respect to uh, QP. So, so I had equivariance at R, I moved it to Q, and then I undid that, but I undid it at the prime P. Well, I kind of had a definition. I had this FR, I defined a new function FQ, and then I defined a new function FQP. Well, if I sort of put infinity instead of P here, I would have just gone back from FQ to FR. I'm just saying there's an isomorphism. You go from FR to FQ by some simple formula. There's an inverse formula that would let you go the other way. But in that inverse formula, replace infinity by P. 
and you instead move to a different world again. You move, so you move from kind of the Archimedean world to the rational world to the Piatic world. So, so here's a space of Piatic automorphic forms. And you can sort of ask now, well, does this do a better job of looking like the space of our Galois representations? So, for example, uh, one thing that Galois representations can do is they can deform because the representations of this uh, profinite group into this QP, you can, you can move them around. This, you can, when you write down these Galois representations here, you can almost imagine that this is a topologically finitely presented group. So if this were literally a finitely presented group, then these rows will be classified by a representation variety. You would have some finite number of matrices satisfying some finite number of relations to describe this row. If this was a topologically finitely presented group, then inside that representation variety, there'd be some analytic locus where some inequalities were satisfied. There were the, in, the, there were the conditions for the representation to extend from the finitely presented dense subgroup to the, to the actual GF. So you can kind of morally imagine that these rows are parameterized by, an, uh, by a kind of analytic manifold. So these rows d can deform. Whereas the cusp, the cusp of all representations, they were in here, there was a direct sum. So these pies were not deforming. So there was a pretty big difference in behavior on the two sides. So, so the first thing to say is that this object, this space, is no longer going to decompose as a direct sum of irreducibles in any way, shape, or form. It's a very non-semi-simple representation of the piatic group. But what you can do is, well, because I fixed the primes away from, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to give it a name because otherwise it's going to be too unwieldy. So I'll call it A now, but maybe A tilde. It's kind of some kind of completed thing, periodically completed automorphic forms. And I, I fixed the level away from P. So there's some heck operators that act, all the heck operators at the primes away from, at the unramified primes act. So I have a heck algebra that acts. Now, what it turns out is that if you have two classical cusp forms whose eigenvalues, whose Hecker eigenvalues are congruent mod P, you can't really separate them out discreetly in this space. But what you can do is you can look at systems of Hecker eigenvalues modulo P. And that's a kind of discrete invariant of, of, of this space. And so this thing, this A tilde, will break up as a direct sum over the maximal ideals. So this Hecker algebra is a ZP algebra. It has maximal ideals. And so you can take a direct sum over the maximal ideals of this A tilde localized at these M. So that's the kind of most you can get in terms of just a spectral decomp you know, a naive direct sum decomposition. And so on here, this Hecker algebra, some completion at the prime M, this Hecker algebra will act. So, so far everything I said will be okay for any compact group, but now let me suppose G is a unitary group. Then, by the same theorems I described before, we know that this maximal ideal M corresponds to some representation from GQ into GLN FP bar. And then. Uh, let me. Um, yeah, I mean, here I should have probably a quadratic imaginary extension of Q that was giving rise to this unity group. But let me not worry too much about that. So, and then we can look at this spec of this TM. So, this spec of TM is sort of the first sort of non-discrete spectral invariant you can find out of this space of piatic automorphic forms. So what is the point in spec TM? Well, it's kind of a system of eigenvalues that's carried by A tilde. Now, that might be a system of Hecker eigenvalues that happens to come from a classical modular form, but it might not. 
And in fact, this spec TM, this TM will be some nice Netherian ring of positive cool dimension. So this spec TM will be really a nice space, not just a finite set of points. And in fact, this will embed into a space of representations rows. So sort of the space of row taking GQ into GLN QP bar. So that these rows, they should lift row bar. So we kind of have this fixed row bar and then we can look at all the rows that lift that row bar. So this is a statement about Galois representations attached to periodic interpolations of classical modular forms. So as far as I know, the Hitter was the first person to really imagine this kind of, uh, kind of attaching Galois representations to periodically interpolated aut automorphic forms and then Barry Mazur kind of formulated those ideas in this language. And a, th a conjecture of Gouveia and Mazur, say in the case n equals two, is that this should be an, in fact an isomorphism and we believe the same thing should be true in general. And so this is, this should be an isomorphism. And, and, uh, you know, and uh, it's known to be in many cases actually, even uh, for larger values, like I think n equals three, Shinevi A has work on this, for example. So there's a, there's a, there are techniques for uh, investigating this question. So that's the first sign that we've done something right. Because now this space of periodic automorphic forms is capturing all the Galois representations. There's no longer any kind of funny condition about Hodge numbers and so on, because we got rid of that condition on the automorphic side too. So that's the, uh, so then once you have that, you'd like to know if you could go back and uh, recover the fontaine langlands So in, uh, so, so on the automorphic side, we uh, have, on the automorphic side, we have the classical modular forms inside the periodic modular forms. And then on, in the space of all these uh, Gower representations, we have inside them the ones that satisfy this Durham condition of having integral Hodge numbers and, and a little bit more. So we'd like to know if those match up. So, the, uh, well, that turns out to be not such an easy question to, to answer just straight away. Even, even when you know that this is an isomorphism, you have a periodic modular form, and it gives you a Galois representation. And that Galois representation is but one of the ones that's conjectured to come from a classical modular form. It doesn't seem to be so easy to somehow nevertheless tell that your modu periodic modular form is actually classical. You know, it's in here somewhere and you just don't know much about it. So why don't you know much about it? Because this whole isomorphism is happening by looking at the primes away from P. Right? The whole way that we can connect our periodic automorphic form and our Galois representation is by looking at the Hecker polynomials at unramified primes and comparing them with Frobenius at unramified primes. But this Durham condition is a condition at P. So the kind of only naive way to connect that to, to this characterization of this map is you have to go through the mysterious global glue and that if we understood that global glue well, we'd understand all these conjectures already. So, so that's kind of what makes it difficult. So one thing we'd like to do is to try and use more than just a spectral theory of this TM, but try and use this space itself and use the representation theory on this space of, of the Piatic group and sort of take a slightly longer approach maybe deeper approach where you try and understand better what's happening here. Because one thing we can see is that the classical modular forms are characterized by the way GQP acts. Because look, on this space of, on this space of modular forms here, this was the same thing whether you had QP or Q or R. It was all the same. And that's a, a smooth representation of the Piatic group. The, the vectors, the, the, the elements here are locally constant functions. And then here, the elements are algebraic functions. So the classical modular forms have a characterization. They're locally algebraic functions. So what we can think about is you can think about this A tilde, localized at M, as really being some bundle of, say, Piatic Banach spaces lying over this spec. And inside here, we have these locally algebraic functions. 
and they'll be supported on some locus. So inside here, if you fix a V, we have V tensor AV, and that will be living on some locus inside here. If you like, you can kind of remember this is just the same as homing over G. Well, this is homing uh, V into A tilde M, and it should be equivariant for some open group in the piadic points. So, so you have this bundle, and then you can hom V into this, shrinking down this KP as much as you need. And then that's some sub-bundle which has some support. So it lives over some locus. And over here, we have the locus of Durand representations with these Hodge numbers. And we could ask if they're the same. So, well, actually, we know that the answer is yes when n equals 2. And, well, everyone's working on it for higher n. There, there are cases that are known and, and many cases that are not known. But I want to finish in the last 10 minutes by explaining uh, some joint work, which is sort of an approach to investigating this question. So, uh, so now I need my, my colored chalk. So, so I'm, I'm going to draw some pictures in the case n equals 2. So n equals 2, I'm going to draw this space. So there it is. It's two-dimensional for the experts on fixing the determinant. And then, now this condition of being Durham is a local condition at P. So it makes sense to sort of restrict attention to what's happening locally at P. So this is uh, the GQ representations. This is the GQP representations. Again, I'm fixing the determinant, and then it's three-dimensional. And there's a map. Actually, it's a theorem I learned from uh, Vitesse Pasquinas that this is a finite map, actually. And it's not so much of a loss, conceptually, to think that it's a closed embedding. So we can really think that this, uh, that this square is kind of sitting inside this blue thing. And now, we have these Durham loci. So in this case, they'll be one-dimensional. And they'll meet this uh, two-dimensional square in some points. Well, I mean, one and two add up to three, so they should meet in a finite number of points. And in fact, they do. And that sort of related, that finiteness is related to uh, the idea that if you fix the weight in the level, there's only finitely many eigenforms. So, and now we have our, we have our bundle of Banach spaces kind of lying just over this green object. But we're trying to characterize the locally algebraic vectors as living over this red locus. Well, our life would be easier if we, for example, a priori had something over a, local, a piatic local lens. Suppose we had a piatic local lens over the whole blue cube. Suppose we knew that that periodic local lens had all beautiful properties, including its locally algebraic vectors were exactly supported on the Durham loci. And suppose we knew an analog of Carriol's local global compatibility. Suppose we knew that our global representations were compatible with local lens. And suppose we, knew, so suppose we knew that our bundle over the green square was just a restriction of the bundle over the blue square. If we knew all those three things, it would be done. So in a kind of slightly longer term approach to studying the fontaine mesa langlands question, is to try and construct a piatic local langlands over this whole blue cube that has these properties, that, that knows the local analog, that has a local analog of fontaine mesa built into it. So try, you try and build a piatic local langlands over this blue object whose, uh, where the locally algebraic vectors are exactly supported on these red Durham loci. And which when you restrict it to the, to the global green square, gives you modular automorphic forms. So, 
So in the case of uh, GO2 QP, so in the case uh, of two-dimensional representations, the one drawn here, actually that periodic local Langlands is constructed, basically by uh, Pierre Colmez. And so and this, then this proof strategy works. And so that's an approach to, to proving uh, Fontaine Maser for uh, the case n equals two. So in general, we don't have this periodic local Langlands. And you know, various people are trying to build it. So I have about five minutes left. So let me just describe very quickly an attempt to build it, which is far from, from where I've suggested we want to go, but is further than nowhere. I mean, it's closer to, it's like epsilon, which is kind of small, but bigger than zero. So that's, you hope that Archimedes axiom will then take over in some subtle way. So I want to um, finish by describing this joint work. So this is joint, so this is a sixth author project. So there's Anna Cariani, myself, Toby G, David Garrity, Vitas Pashkunas, and Sagwu Shin. So here's, here's what we do. We start with, so, so we're gonna build something. So remember, I wanted three things. I wanted, I wanted a periodic local Langlands over the blue cube. I wanted the locally algebraic vectors to live on the Duram loci. And I wanted to have something that's compatible with automorphic forms. So, it's a GLN of a GLN. GLN. But, but globally com a unitary group and locally GLN of a periodic group. So, so we're going to sort of follow the, the global constructions of local Langlands, which at least by their construction give you compatibility with automorphic forms. So we're going to build something that's at least compatible with automorphic forms. The problem is we won't in the end know all the other things we'd like to know. So how are we going to do it? Well, we're just going, you know, one way to build classical local Langlands is to take, say, a supercuspidal representation, use the trace formula to realize that inside an actual cuspidal automorphic representation. Then you get a local Gower representation. You get a global Gower representation, hence a local one, and then you hope that that's purely local, or vice versa. I mean, you can kind of run that argument either way. And the basic idea is that you can take your cuspidal, supercuspidal local representations can be achieved globally. So one difficulty we have is that most local rows, say even on this orange locus, can't be realized globally because this is a curve. It has, a, say, an uncountable number of points, whereas in the whole world, there's only countably many automorphic forms, automorphic representations. So luckily, there's a method for, uh, for getting around this, which is a method of Taylor Wiles and further developed by Diamond and Kissin, which uh, which lets you really do this analog of a trace formula argument. So what happens in the Taylor-Wiles method is some amazing thing. In the Taylor-Wiles method, you start with this situation where you have this embedding, and then you say, I'm now going to allow ramification at some other prime Q. And then you say, well, that's, then there's no way we'll have an embedding anymore because how could what's happening locally at P possibly remember what happens at this other prime Q when you allow ramification at Q. But what Taylor and Wiles showed is that by you know, this subtle Gower cohomology computations, it's generalized by Jack Thorne and in the end to uh, GLN, Clausel Harris Taylor and then Jack Thorne to GLN. What they showed is that if you choose these auxiliary primes Q very carefully, you can in fact still get an embedding. So we choose an auxiliary prime Q that's congruent to one mod P and that thickens up this space slightly. How does it thicken it up? Just because Q minus the, uh, we add this ramification at Q. So we have some diamond operators at the prime Q, which have, which are, have a P group in them. And this P group, periodically is not, the representations of this P group are not discrete periodically there. So we get a little null potent thickening. And that gives us a little null potent thickening here that gives us a little null potent thickening along this red curve. And then you choose another prime Q that's congruent to one mod P squared. 
and then you get slightly more vinyl protein thickening. And so you can kind of actually fill out these whole red curves by kind of choosing very carefully these different Taylor Wiles primes. And then over this Taylor Wiles space, we have our automorphic forms. So they're sitting on these nil potent thickenings. And then by a compactness argument, you can interpolate those and produce a, uh, a, a piatic group representation living over ultimately the whole blue cube. Thicker and thicker pieces, and then you take a, take a limit by a compactness argument, and you get a Banach space living over the whole bu blue cube. It's a piatic representation. I mean, a representation of a piatic group. And you know that the algebraic you, part of the method shows that the locally algebraic vectors are supported on some union of these orange curves. But unfortunately, you don't know that it's all of them. So we produce a kind of candidate piatic local Langlands by these global methods. But, so the two things we don't know, which are two huge things, but mm -hmm. uh, that we don't know that it's purely local. Purely local. We don't know it's purely local. We sort of build it globally, and it, this seems as if global origin, we don't know that it's purely local. Because you don't have a good way to really characterize that. And we don't know that it's locally algebraic vectors have the, are supported on all of the Durham locus, just on some, some, some collection of components of the Durham locus. We know it's supported on Durham, in fact, on a union of components, but you have this general difficulty in the Taylor Wiles method is once there's more than one component, it becomes hard to know that you hit every component, and we don't know that. But, but that's sort of where we are, and that's, that's sort of where the subject is to some extent. So I'll stop. restricted to a quadratic imaginary field, and then the sign doesn't matter, and so now it's, there's, you know, there's, you're looking at GL2 for the quadratic imaginary field, it's five dimensional, that thing is there somewhere. Now it won't be in the um, closure of the, the kind of classical locus, which will no longer be, I mean this, this, this statement I had of this kind of density statement sort of won't be true naively over the quadratic imaginary field, but uh, but if you have Schultz's classes, I mean, they should be enough. Those Gower representations coming from Torgen too should fill out that whole five-dimensional Gower deformation space, and then somewhere your even representation will be. And then you have to then you have to know how to recognize it. Which, well, there's actually there's some kind of. I can tell you if you like, but there's some ideas. Yeah. Am I right? Uh, ramify, yeah, I mean, in the end, the, uh, yeah, so these Vs, right, these Vs are representations of, uh, they're finite dimensional representations of a periodic group. So they correspond to regular Hodge numbers. So every HPQ has dimension at most one. So in all, I mean, it's not particularly my approach, sort of in all the investigations of how automorphic forms connect to Gawa representations, you sort of always seem to have to uh, restrict to these uh, regular case because that's what by Arthur Shimura, or by these algebraic modular forms, connects to... Um, yeah, I think self -tool. Yeah, I think this is important. Then, then you can see the unit I think this is... Ah, I see. Um, <laughs> I see. Well, in fact, in the end, hopefully no, because there's very recent work of, well, of our Harris, as I said, Harris, Lahn, Taylor, and Thorne, and then subsequent work of Schultzer, which construct our representations in the uh, non-self-dual case. In fact, even attached to torsion classes in cohomology. And then there's, on the, going the other way, the, so there's kind of the, this direction, there's work of Caligari and Geraghty, which uses a taylor wiles method in, our, in that setting as well. So in fact, we're kind of suddenly, in the last two years, have been put into a world where this self-dual condition doesn't really have to apply anymore. Any other questions? Well, let's uh, thank Matt. So what, one, one announcement. So it's an important announcement. So, Secretary and Monday, no, Secretary and Monday, the talks is
Tag, it's 9.30.